would like to announce our first speaker, Dr. Rebecca Isaksa. Rebecca is a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Edinburgh. She received her PhD in pharmaceutical sciences from Uppsala University earlier this year. She's also the current chair of FIP Special Interest Group for Young Pharmaceutical Sciences. So Rebecca, you have a word. Thank you so much for that nice introduction, Shrinka. And actually, I would also like to thank you for inviting me to this webinar. It is uh, really fun to be here, and I'm glad that so many of you were able to join us to listen to this webinar. Um, so I just wanted to sort of start with a slide um, that describes my background. And like Shrinka said, I did my PhD or got my PhD in pharmaceutical sciences earlier this year. And I'm now a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Edinburgh. I originally did my Master of Science in Chemical Engineering before I moved on to Pharmaceutical Sciences. And I am also the current chair of the FIP Special Interest Group for Young Pharmaceutical Scientists. So if we, we're going to come back to this picture a little later on, but as we move on to the next slide, um, I wanted to, oh, this looks a little weird. Uh, compared to my uh, original slide. Okay, um, this was supposed to depict the um, <laughs> drug discovery and development process, uh, sort of to highlight to you um, where you could do research or work as a pharmaceutical scientist. And, and the pharmaceutical, um, the drug discovery and development process is a very sort of uh, broad um, and multidisciplinary field where you will get a chance to work with uh, many different sort of scientists outside of your field and together within your field and that's one of the reasons why I decided to go into pharmaceutical sciences because I did not just want to do chemistry I also wanted my chemistry to be applicable I wanted there to be a biological reason for doing it and during my PhD I have been able to work with both biologists and physicists and computational scientists. So um, I just wanted to bring this in to sort of highlight that pharmaceutical sciences is a very broad field. And I'm sure you will be able to find this uh, slide uh, or what it depicts on, online if you just search for drug discovery and development. So if we move on to the next slide. <clears throat> there are several ways of getting into pharmaceutical sciences, and I'm sure that many of you who listen are probably pharmacy students. Uh, you don't have to be a pharmacy student to move into pharmaceutical sciences, but I would say you are well equipped to move into pharmaceutical sciences because you do get a very broad uh, education, basically focused on uh, how the body interacts with drugs and how the drugs affect the body. Um, but you can also be a chemical engineer like me. You can have done a, an undergraduate education in chemistry or biology, even as a medical doctor or a nurse, you can later on move into pharmaceutical sciences. Um, the most common way is to do a PhD education in any pharmaceutical scientific field that you find interesting. It can be medicinal chemistry, pharmacokinetics or dynamics. It can be within clinical testing or clinical testing, toxicology, or even uh, pharmacy practice. But there are a lot of different fields that you can move into. After your PhD, you would then be able to move into all these different areas, for example, academic research. And it can be either as a researcher, not necessarily doing um, a career, but only working with research. You could also go the academic career way and become a lecturer and then move on to a professorship if you qualify and are willing to put the effort into that. You can also, of course, move into industry. There are many opportunities in industry, both doing research but also leading other research teams. You can work as a medical science liaison or even a patent attorney if you want to. You can also, of course, work in government uh, approvement of drugs to market is one of the biggest and most important aspects of the drug discovery and development process. And as a PhD within pharmaceutical sciences, you will be a 
very well equipped to make judgments on if drugs are ready to go to market or if there's more evidence needed or more testing needed. Now, I just want to say as well that you don't have to do a PhD to work in the pharmaceutical sciences field. You can go from an undergraduate to academic research industry or government, but you will have slightly different career options available to you. And you might not be leading uh, your own research teams and stuff like that. So um, if you want to do research and, and like sort of puzzles and figuring things out, uh, a PhD is definitely something that would be good for you in order to, to move into those career pathways afterwards. So as we move on to the next slide, I <clears throat> wanted to discuss academic titles. Um, because this can be uh, slightly uh, unclear for everyone to understand. So I'm a PhD, a Doctor of Philosophy, and that is a title that you gain after a three to five year education where you will do research together with the supervisor. Um, depending on the country you're doing your PhD in, it could be within teaching or with teaching or without teaching. It can also be with uh, classes or without classes. So PhD is a title that you gain and if you leave academia you will still hold that title. It is also a title that you have to earn in the sense that you have to defend your work at the end of this education to prove that you have reached sort of the standards that is required to be calling yourself a doctorate of philosophy in this field. There's also postdoc, which I am right now. So postdoctoral studies. Um, that is an academic position where you either do research together with a supervisor or you acquire your own grants uh, and start your own research projects, often in collaboration with a, um, a supervisor as well. And this is something that you will do for maybe two, four or six years before you move on either to start working as a researcher uh, or trying to become a lecturer. And a lecturer is an academic position where you do a little bit of research, but you also do a lot of teaching. Um, usually the research you do, you don't do it yourself. Instead, you are um, supervising maybe a PhD student or maybe a postdoc, maybe a few master students who do the research for you. So you have your own research idea that you're working for, but you don't actually go into the lab and you know get your hands dirty that much anymore. Um, from a lecturer position, you can be promoted to become a professor, which is also an academic position. Uh, here you have your own research team and you probably do a little bit of teaching, but you will very rarely see professors in the lab. Although I guess uh, John B. Goodenough, who recently won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, is the exception to that because he's still in the lab doing uh, his own research. But uh, like I said, this is an academic position. Most often professors are also pulled into working on boards and committees within the university uh, framework. If you leave a professorship uh, position or a lectureship position, it's not a title that you bring with you, although and uh, some still like to call themselves professor, but the professor title is usually something that is tied to your um, employment and not uh, your academic sort of uh, like a PhD is a title that you still have. But a title that you can get uh, in academia is also docent. And that is a title that you get that you don't have to defend in terms of taking a test or anything like that, but you need to reach a certain level of expertise within a field. Usually that requires you to have done a certain amount of teaching in the field and sometimes also it requires you to have a certain amount of papers in the field. Uh, you can become a docent from an um, industry position but it's most common that you get it from an academic position. So if we move on to the next slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about what do you actually need to gain a PhD position? I'm really sorry if there's any background noise outs right now, but I hope that you can still hear me. Um, so there are some requirements uh, that is going to vary a little bit, but depending on 
uh, the country you're in, but usually it requires you to have a four to five year undergraduate education in a relevant field, for example, as a pharmacy or pharmacist. Um, often uh, you will have to have taken classes on Master of Science level. Um, if you are uh, from a non-native English speaking country and you want to do a PhD in another country, you might have to prove that you can write and speak English. And this is simply because English is often considered sort of the language of science. That is how we most often communicate our science. And it is very important in research to be able to present your science and talk to other researchers about the research that you do. Uh, and therefore, you might be required to show that you have the English skills uh, needed. This is a question that I've heard before. Are grades important? And I wish I could give you a clear answer, but this depends a lot on the country you're looking at, but also the institution. So both yes and no. Uh, some institutions, uh, for them, grades are very important. For others, they look more to what co courses you have taken during your undergraduate and also if you've done any extra research project or things like that. So when you start looking for a PhD position, uh, it is important to sort of identify the country and institution that you want to go to and make sure that you look what their requirements are so that you don't miss anything. There are some ways that you can, of course, improve your CV. And I would like to say that even though I sometimes see that a lot of students focus on getting good grades, um, but extracurricular activities should not be ignored because it can be very important um, in your application to be able to show, for example, that maybe you worked as a teacher's assistant. That is something that helped me during um, when I applied for my PhD position. Um, perhaps you can do a research project together with a researcher uh, as a side project uh, in parallel to your studies. That is also something that I think many researchers and supervisors value to see that you have some uh, research experience. But I also think it's important to be able to show, or if you can show that you've been volunteering for arranging a conference or a career fair, that is also something that can be very valuable on a CV. So. Uh, don't forget the extracurricular activities as well. So moving on to the next slide, where do you find a PhD position? And this is again uh, something that can vary a lot between uh, countries on how you, uh, how PhD positions are uh, sort of awarded and uh, stuff like that. But um, one way to start looking is of course at university websites. Uh, for example, in Sweden, where I did my PhD, uh, positions are advertised and it's a specific position uh, related to a specific project. You then apply like it's, it was a regular job uh, and then you're called for an interview if you move on from the uh, first round. Um, there are also countries where you have sort of university-wide programs for PhD uh, programs. Uh, where you will apply to the program itself uh, on certain dates uh, around the year and then you will be appointed a supervisor depending on your research interests and also the PhD supervisors available. Um, I think it can also be very good to sort of look at different research groups to see uh, which research groups are available that have the same types of interests as you have. Um, you can always check their websites. What type of research do they do? And if you decide to contact a research uh, leader or a group leader, uh, make sure that it's a relevant email because many supervisors are very busy. Uh, so make sure that the email that you send is something that is relevant for them. Perhaps you can tell them uh, that you would like to do your honors project with them or um, that you are interested in working extra together with them uh, on a project. And usually they're very open to accepting students into their lab. So uh, remember that if you contact a researcher, their time is very uh, strained and make sure that the email you send actually counts. Um, 
it's also worthwhile following uh, universities and research groups on LinkedIn because sometimes they advertise their positions uh, on LinkedIn as well and other social media. In some countries, you can also find countrywide calls from different funding agencies. And you will then apply to the funding agency who will pair you up with the supervisor who is receiving funding from that uh, funding agency. Um, but this is not in every country and, and you would have to look into the countries you're interested in if there are such uh, possibilities for you. Okay, if we move on to the next slide. Do you need to find your own funding? And often, no. So many university PhD programs are usually funded. Uh, you would not have to find your own uh, financing for uh, university-wide PhD programs. Um, advertised positions are also usually funded, but you need to remember to check with the university what the funding covers. Usually it's consumables in the lab, it's your salary and things like that. But sometimes you might have to find your own funding because you might not be eligible for the grant that the PhD position has required or acquired. Uh, so you may have to apply for additional grants to cover for your salary, for example. Uh, some universities also have a tuition fee that can be waived for uh, national uh, applicants, but if you're an international applicant, you may have to pay a tuition fee, which might not be uh, covered by um, the uh, funding that the university or the researcher has already acquired. So you may need to apply for uh, funding to cover a tuition fee. Again, you need to check with each university what applies to them uh, because our world is very um, global and very different in, in different areas of the world. So uh, let's move on to the next slide. So this is something that I was told as I started my undergraduate. Um, and a lot of people talked about this, like networking is so important and it's very important and you have to do networking. And I always struggle to sort of understand how it would really be useful for me. But um, I did try my very best at networking. And as I'll show on the next slide, um, I actually had use of it, but there are different ways of networking. And I think it's important to remember that networking is not only something you do with people who are further on in your career. Uh, you should also consider your classmates as being part of your network because yes, you're taking this class together now, but in 10 years, you will both be in your own careers and maybe you'll be in positions that you'll be able to help each other. So you should always consider your classmates as potential future collaborators that you would want to have in your network. Career fairs is a great way of networking. You can both, if you're helping out to arrange it, you get to meet people from other parts of the university that you can network with, but you can also meet um, people from industry that you can gain contacts with. So attending career fairs can be very useful. Um, Social events is something that most universities arrange for their undergraduate students. And I think it's important to attend those because again, it is a way of meeting people from other parts of the university whom today you might not see how they'll be uh, useful in your network, but in the future, they might become really important for you. Many universities also offer exchange programs for their students and I would definitely recommend everyone to partake in that. Uh, having international experience is something that's very valued on your CV. It's also a great way of meeting people from other countries and learning more about other countries and, and networking in that way. Um, I also added student representation here. So many universities want to include their students in sort of course evaluation work and things like that. And that's a great way of meeting researchers because many researchers are also lecturers who teach. And when you meet them in that uh, context, they will have a, a face to your name uh, and you'll be able to learn more about their research and also make that sort of network connection with them. If it's at all possible, later in your undergraduate, when you're on the Master of Science level, 
uh, it might be valuable to partake in conferences. If you live in a big city, there might be opportunities uh, without having to travel far. There might be a conference in your nearby uh, area that you could attend. Usually they have reduced fees for students, or you could even apply for funding to uh, go to the conference without having to pay anything. And it, will, it is a great way of meeting researchers, learning what type of research is out there, what would be interesting for you to do your PhD in, uh, and of course, network. Um, I would also like to say, remember to also connect on professional networks. Um, so if you've talked to someone that you met in a context, remember to also reach out to them on, for example, LinkedIn or Research Grid, because I, they might remember you now, but in five years when you might need to reach out to them again, um, if you haven't already made that connection, it might be hard for them to remember who you were and how you uh, first connected. So remember to always use the, the professional networks that you have available. And again, it is very worthwhile following universities and different research groups because you can learn a lot from them uh, on the social media. So let's move on to the next slide. And this is a slide that you have already seen, but here I wanted to sort of explain to you why I've been talking about these networking and, and getting involved in different ways. And that is because when I was doing my undergraduate in chemical engineering, I also worked extra as a teacher's assistant. I did two extra research projects uh, and I partook in an international exchange program. And I also co-arranged several social events for new students, which was a great way of meeting new people and making all these connections. And when I then applied for my PhD position, something that I know my supervisor valued a lot in my application was that I had this teaching experience, I had done research, uh, and I had had a, an international experience, which are three things that they really valued highly in my application. And I just want to say those two research projects, one of them was definitely not within uh, medicinal chemistry at all. It was very far away from medicinal chemistry. And, and when I first did that uh, project, I thought it was very interesting and I wanted to learn. It did result in the paper, so I did get a lot out of it. But I also learned that maybe that particular field was not the field that I wanted to do continued research in. So doing research projects, you might find that this area is not at all what I want to do, which is also a good thing to learn. Uh, during my PhD, I worked a lot as a PhD student representative on different boards and committees at the university. And that is actually how I found my postdoc position, because one of the professors that I had been in a working group with as a PhD student representative, um, he knows my current supervisor. And when my current supervisor here in Edinburgh contacted him and said, I'm looking for a chemist, do you know anyone? He thought of me, he sent me an email and said, Rebecca, my friend in Edinburgh is looking for a chemist, I think you should apply. And I don't think I would have heard about this position if I hadn't had that person in my network. Uh, so you might get help from your network from the most unexpected uh, places. Uh, the reason why I became the chair of FIP's special interest group for young pharmaceutical scientists is because during my PhD, I co-arranged a conference with FIP for young pharmaceutical scientists. And after that, uh, they approached me and asked if I would like to lead this new special interest group. So I feel that when I started my undergraduate, I didn't really see how this would all help me. But looking back, it has really helped me in ways that I could not predict uh, when I started. So just some final notes. Uh, to summarize um, my part of the talk, if we can move to the next slide. Yes, thank you. So pharmaceutical sciences is a field that will offer you a lot of opportunities for interdisciplinary research, and you will be able to work with a lot of different uh, researchers and get a lot of important and really valuable views on 
uh, your project and also different new ways of seeing uh, your research. If you're looking to do a PhD and you're looking to move abroad, remember to start looking early into what you might need to be able to show to that institution uh, and what is required uh, because the system you are going to might be very different from the one you have in your home country. Don't underestimate the power of networking. There is um, definitely a lot to be gained from networking. Uh, it does not have to be specific networking events. It can just be meeting new people at a social event. So remember that networking is really important. Uh, if you want to join our LinkedIn group, the uh, special interests groups LinkedIn group, you can do that through this link and it's also going to be in the email. So please do join us there because we do try uh, to arrange different webinars that will definitely be of interest to you uh, if you're interested in pharmaceutical sciences. So please join us there uh, as well. And I just want to say, remember that you're always allowed to change your mind. Uh, you might start, uh, you might make a choice and after two years you realize this is not what I want to do. It is okay to change your mind. Uh, I have changed my mind many times and it's worked out very well. So remember that you can always, always change your mind. Uh, and with that, I would like to say thank you and hand over to the next speaker. Thank you, Rebecca, for this great lecture and useful advice. You could really be our role model. Uh, and we already have some questions, but first we will proceed with our second speaker, Dr. Davor Šakić, Assistant Professor at the Faculty of Pharmacy and Biochemistry, University of Zagreb, where he got both his master's and PhD degree. He already has 20 scientific papers and he will tell us something about science of publishing. Thank you very much. I hope that everybody hears me um, as well. So thank you for a kind introduction. Um, actually, my current position is called docent in creation, but when we try to translate docent, we usually do the assistant professor as I do have some teaching uh, obligations. So probably that translates right. So the next slide is actually the most important um, sentence I have ever heard in academia, publish or perish. What does it mean? You have to publish your scientific work or you will perish as a scientist because you won't get any grants. So let's continue. What does publishing mean and what does this mean? So we have different types of publication. We first do some scientific work in our laboratories and from there we write short reports. I got this result, some Excel tables, some graphs, some something. From those reports, it's very easy to make posters for scientific conferences or to even present at scientific conferences with your slide presentations. Um, after you leave your project or are you're moving to another project, it's also a good thing to write a technical manual how you did something, how did you measure something, what was your protocol and everything else. So another student, or another researcher can go and continue your work. Usually you work uh, on your science to get your thesis or your dissertation, but also you want to publish it into a journal article. If you have enough results, you can also write book chapters or books, but the most probable, probable, probable reason you will um, spend most of your time is actually doing research and writing research and grant proposals for more, more money. So now let's continue types of articles uh, that we have. So first is news articles that provide a brief overview of scientific findings for a general um, audience, models. Then you have meeting abstracts, papers and proceedings for more knowledgeable people that provide brief description of original research and it's usually presented at conferences. Then we have the full research articles that present new and original scientific findings. And then we have review articles which are very, very useful to have a bird's eye view on the field or sub discipline or subject. And they have all the ma major 
uh, small researchers, uh, small research parts um, condensed and synthesized into one big uh, topic. Now let's talk about journals. Scientific journals are usually uh, a weekly or two weekly or monthly uh, published. Um, and you have heard for, of some of them. The most uh, important ones are Nature and Science, and you can Higgs boson, the Nobel Prize winners, they publish in Nature and Science all the time. But there are different, different, different journals that span from local, small journals published on local universities to the big ones like Nature Science, but also there are big groups that publish a lot of journals under them. Uh, one of the most popular is Elsevier, Wiley, but also in chemistry and pharmaceutical. We have American Chemical Society publication or Royal Society of Chemistry publications. Um, I, all of those journals uh, have different impact on the field, but we'll talk about this later. But why would, should we publish in journals? Why just don't we write books and book chapters? Um, that's on the next slide, please. First, we want to register our scientific work. We want to have a timestamp to officially note who submitted scientific results first. That was a big uh, problem earlier in 18th century or even earlier when different people discovered the same things but in different countries and they published, but they couldn't connect. So the importance of networking was even then very important. Uh, also, we want to get certification that our scientific work is good. And this is done through peer review process. We want to disseminate our results and say how our scientific breakthroughs um, is uh, part of the larger picture. And we want to preserve our scientific knowledge, our research for posterity. So different researchers know what we have done and what not to do because it doesn't work. Sometimes we publish negative results, not that commonly, but sometimes we do. Now let's talk about peer review because this is something that is very important in science. It helps to determine the quality, validity, significance, and originality of research. How? Because we, when we publish, we want to uh, submit uh, our paper, we submit it to the editor. Editor is the first one that sees our manuscript and says, hmm, is this good, bad, poor research? Can it be better? And then he assigns reviewers. Um, those are researchers in the field that won't be known to the author of the science uh, article. So it's blind, that I really don't know who my reviewers are. Sometimes from their reviews, I can guess who they are, but I really don't know. And then reviewer has a task to read my manuscript and to correct mistakes and finally give recommendation, should it be published or should it have minor, major revisions or it should be rejected and not uh, published in this journal. If we have minor or major uh, revision by all three reviewers, then um, editor has a discretional law to see uh, should uh, he give an opportunity to author to revise the paper and then resubmit it, or he just plain rejects and says, good luck, um, have, Good luck with this paper. We don't love it. We don't like it. It doesn't fit the scope or something like that. Reviewers should treat all manuscripts in the same manner, but we are human and sometimes this doesn't happen. But as you have three reviewers, you usually have two good reviews where reviewers do their best to um, critically and objectively look at your article. And there's always the second reviewer that usually just doesn't want to publish you. In the next slide, let's talk about citations. This is something that takes the most of my time when, I, when I'm working into writing my papers. Because for each sentence, which is known, I have to give credit. 
and citations is a way to give credit on what others have done. Uh, because every little scientific research breakthrough is uh, founded on the research or and science that was done before. So we just perpetuate this circle and we are standing on the shoulders of those giants and we have to give credit to those giants. And also we want to support our claims to and so so everything is connected and th this is very important for us to um, be consistent in our claims because there are some pitfalls uh, that happen in science and this is on the next slide that some of the researchers actually fabricate data they just make up research data or they have do false claim or they manipulate existing research data and sometimes even plagiarism that previous work is taken at best or self plagiarism and also self citation because with the more citation your paper has this is the sign that it probably means something more in the field than less cited paper so those are clearly four things not to do in your research paper don't steal other people's work, don't lie, don't fabricate. In the next slide is the big question. What is the right journal? For this, we have to first see for each journal, what is the aim and scope? Is it physical or organic chemistry? If it's physical or organic chemistry, you won't publish pharmaceutical stuff. Then you want to have journal metrics to see what is the impact factor, time to review, and time to publish. Because sometimes you want to publish quickly. Or sometimes you want to publish good. So you have to choose between impact factor and time to publish. Also, you want to, uh, when you are choosing the right journal, it's a good thing to see uh, journals where most of your citations are located. It's very important to see the acceptance rates. For example, rejection rates of 90% is for nature and science. So every 10 paper submitted to nature is actually published after peer review. Um, circulation count is actually what is the journal's audience. And this is actually how many libraries, how many downloads, how many uh, visits to the pages of the journal are here. And also the most important part is publishing fee. How much do you have to pay? If you don't have a grant, if you don't have uh, money to burn on publishing fee, then probably this journal isn't right for you. Continuing is one of the nicer things that uh, every article that is published recently is on the web and on the web, Every article gets its own digital object identification. And from using this DOI, you can easily find whatever you want. This is the unique uh, way to find on the internet. Uh, this is actually located, uh, for example, in this article by hmm, good people, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, you can find the DOI and you can find the strings of numbers and letters uh, in the upper corner. Okay, next. Yeah, circled, yeah. About the impact factor. Impact factor indicates is a measure for the journal. The bigger impact factor, the stronger, more known, uh, more prestigious the journal is. How is impact factor calculated? This is the number of times all items published in two years divided by all the number of citable items in two years. What does that, that mean? After I publish an article, in two years time, I expect that some different research will be done that they will cite me. This is um, average for the whole journal, how many citation does paper gain in two years time? The more, the merrier. So, for example, Angevante Chemie, it's around six or, uh, no, it's around nine. Nature is around 30. So, um, but it's okay, it all depends on the field. Uh, but 
when you have so, such large discrepancies, then how do you measure journals uh, between themselves? And this is on the next slide, that you actually sort journals by impact factor in each category. This is, for example, in Chemistry Applied, where you rank all the journals uh, from the, uh, the top. So here, the top impact factor has annual reviews of chemical and biomolecular engineering. It has impact factor 9.6. And there are 71 journals in this cat category that are sorted. And then you actually uh, count and say that first, uh, fourth is the first uh, quartile. And from the rank of first to 17th position, this is the Q1, the best journals. Q2 are okay, better than average. Q3 is lower than average. And Q4 are usually not that good articles. Um, you want to publish in Q1 or Q2, but sometimes you actually get to publish in Q3 or Q4. Usually Q3 or, or, and Q4 is not for the breakthrough science. science. It's more of, um, I have already done something and then I'm just continuing my work on more compounds, on more something. Um, and Q4 is usually reserved for local journals of chemistry or biology uh, that is on the national level. Moving on is how to access to articles. We have traditional publishing where authors publish free of charge and then institution or individual subscribes to journals or they pay per view of the article. And this is something that is mostly known that you cannot access all articles and then you have to find a way how to access them. Uh, the other way is open access publishing where uh, author, institution, or funding agency actually pays for article publication and pays for its processing fee. And then the articles is made freely avail available to all online. Some journals publish exclusively open access, other offer open access options. And then the problem is um, traditional publishing and subscriptions are very uh, expensive. And that's why uh, there is a big movement to uh, make sure that um, all the publishing companies don't profit too much from the work that is actually done by scientists. And that all the research, all the science should be freely available to the whole humanity. And then we get to the uh, bad boys in the industry. On the next slide. We have predatory publishing. This is um, something common as spam, where predatory journals actually want you to publish with them for a smaller fee. But the problem is they have little or no peer control, and they usually just want money. They will publish everything. And usually, I have said the four things you don't want to do, but I have seen um, some work that was actually published in predatory journals that is complete bullshit written in it, just to uh, see if anybody will spot it. For example, I have um, read uh, Time Travel um, Science, that is actually um, a short summary of the Star Trek Voyager uh, episode, and it was published and it has DOI, and it it is a full manuscript that is published full journal article. And this is very, very big problem. And there are also dedicated web pages that uh, track predatory journals, and uh, they try to uh, control them. And in the next slide, uh, this is, again, very important. If you cannot gain access to uh, paper. You can al always try to uh, find it on ResearchGate. This is a Facebook for scientists. And some versions of um, articles uh, prior to revision or um, immediately after revision are published there. 
And also you can connect directly with the scientists and ask them, can you please send me this paper? I'm very interested. Um, also Google Scholar has a good way to find PDFs. Um, ORCID uh, helps uh, identifying authorship of different. This is more like LinkedIn than anything. And then we have referencing software that's Zotero and Mendeley that's between ResearchGate and referencing. Uh, and it gets good su suggestions. But we have talked about um, journal indexes and metrics. We also have H index. This is very important for you to, um, when you are looking for PhD positions and when you are looking um, at professors, we also, scientists and professors can, can be um, um, measured by their age index. This is number of articles with that many citations. For example, age index of five means that you have five articles each with at least five citations. The bigger high index is actually better, more current scientists, more groundbreaking stuff he's doing, or widely known and stuff like that. And with this, um, I would uh, thank you for uh, listening to me. I know uh, that it, it's a bit hard to understand everything, and this is really a science where after you do your scientific things, when you, you're writing up things, the big question is where to publish and how to publish. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dosin Shakic, for this great lecture and explaining us one important part of scientific life. Uh, actually, we have a lot of questions, so we can proceed with that. Uh, first question is how citations are counted. For example, when we are writing our master thesis, we always have some citations. Do authors know that we are used their work? Okay, so I will try to answer this question if it's okay. So, um, uh, master thesis and doctoral thesis are usually uh, not shown into citations uh, because um, those are published on local repositories. Uh, usually only books uh, published by big publishing groups or um, journal journals that are published into good um, journals have their in citation messaging and referencing systems. So yeah, when you write master thesis, your master thesis usually won't be shown as uh, that it has cited this and this article from some big guy. Uh, okay. Thank you. Again, question for you. Uh, do you have any comments on those web pages that allow illegal reading of articles? How does that affect the authors of the paper? Mm. So, this is a controversial topic. Um, there is a Russian page that is very, very, very used. I cannot promote it. Uh, I cannot say that I have used it. I will not mm, say anything about this. Um, the thing is, science should be free. Um, and all the research should be free and widely available. Because of publishing groups that want to uh, profit, uh, the research is not there. So if you cannot do it legally, uh, and legally means going to your uh, local library, uh, so research library, or going or contacting some, somewhere, uh, someone abroad that has access to different library or um, asking authors directly can you please send me your paper then and only then if you can if you cannot wait more than an hour or three or five then you you could uh say that you have to get this article but for me it's better to contact authors directly authors do like to be contacted directly and they do re usually respond quickly okay Thank you. Uh, 
uh, I think this is the question for Rebecca. Uh, what means the title of full professor? What is the difference between professor and full professor? Uh, well, that is really, so professor and full professor are really the same thing, but usually you say full professor to sort of show that it's not an assistant professorship. So sometimes, uh, depending on country, you will have a career pathway that is lecturer, associate professor, and then professor, or the lecturer position has been replaced by the title associate professor. So if you have a title of associate professor, you're sort of a pre-professor. You haven't really reached the full um, sort of qualifications yet to call yourself a professor, but you are still wearing the title associate professor. So full professors just to show that you are not an associate professor, basically. Uh, thank you. Next, in your lecture, you mentioned that some countries uh, do not depend on grades. So, do you maybe know which countries do not depend on grades for PhD? Oh, that is really hard uh, to say, like right off the bat. I know that uh, if most of the Scandinavian countries. I'm from that area, so of course I know that best. I know that most of the Scandinavian uh, countries don't have a sort of specific grade that you need to live up to, but there can of course be variations even within a country. There can be universities that don't require you to have a specific number in terms of like a general grade, but uh, others that do. So it is really hard. I would say Scandinavia is one of the areas that I know of where grades are not the most important thing. Um, if you look, for example, at the UK and the US, it is sometimes more important with your grades um, because you are ranked uh, sort of based off your grades. Um, and I'm not sure if maybe our other speaker has something to add to this as well. Um, may I just, yeah. So, for example, in our system, we want to have uh, top 20% of all the generation, but we also have um, a need for at least two or three professors writing recommendation for you to do this. And also we have an interview. So we have actually a good um, thing going there. For example, I had, um, so not excellent, but um, very good one grades. And I had um, uh, two professors write me a recommendation and I got my uh, into a PhD. Uh, I would just like to talk about the rankings. Uh, a bit between professors, assistant professors, associate professors. This uh, varies very largely depending on where you are. Uh, not all people have all the same requirements going from field to field. Sometimes with um, um, tw uh, 10 articles, you are a full professor in medicine, or you are with um, 20 articles you are just at the beginning of your career because um, every field has its own uh, limitations and everything associated with this and it's not just how many articles how many citations how many age indexes it's also about how much grants you can get and actually is there a position ready for you because it should be like a pyramid full professors small elite group five to six per faculty. Then you have associate professors. You will, you should have uh, five, 15 to 20. And then from down there, you have professors 40 or something. And then you have um, PhD students or, and postdocs. And under them, you have undergrad students. students. Thank you. Uh, again, one question, can online courses help to improve our CV? For example, online courses about health. Oh, I think that is a very difficult question to answer. There are, uh, of course, uh, universities that offer online courses, uh, mocks, I think they're called. Um, 
depending on university, it will be viewed differently. But um, I think in this case, you would have to really contact the university you're interested in and see how they uh, sort of value that in your application. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you. Again, one question for you. Uh, is getting a PhD in pharmacy field useful if we want to work in pharmaceutical industry? Um, it depends a lot on what you want to do in pharmaceutical industry. Uh, you can uh, probably get a position in pharmaceutical industry without having a PhD, uh, but you will probably work more as a laboratory assistant uh, than doing uh, your own research or being put in charge of doing research. So if you want to work with research in the terms of uh, developing things yourself and working on methods and trying to figure out things, then I would say yes, a PhD is definitely a requirement. For many of the large pharmaceutical companies, you might also need to do at least four years of postdoc before you can even be considered for such positions. Um, so, um, but it depends a little bit. If you look at like a small startup company, you might have it, uh, it might be easier for you to join without having done a PhD. But it depends a lot on what you want to do. So if you don't want to do, to be the one in charge of leading research, uh, you might not need to do a PhD. But if you want to do research, then a PhD is, I wouldn't, I don't want to say a requirement, but it is something that will be very, very helpful and open up the field for you a lot. Uh, thank you very much. And this will be our last question. We have even more questions and this is really great, but we don't have enough time for all the questions. I'm really sorry. So the last question, uh, does publishing in predatory journals still count as an article in your scientific work? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, um, sometimes it does count. But then again, funding uh, agencies have um, strict um, uh, rules and policy on what they do count. So uh, usually they count only number of Q1 and Q2 articles, and they also count how many um, people or authors are present uh, on the said article. So uh, you can publish if your funding agency just counts how many uh, articles, but it's better to actually do good work and then publish um, without fee in some Q4 or Q3 uh, system. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with predatory journals, except that I usually get spam mail from them regularly. The, Good thing is that um, as those predatory journals, they actually look at your real articles and they then they, using computer vision or whatever, uh, try to sniff out authors and their addresses. And usually I, I was a first author, but uh, the email address was, um, was mine but they usually just title this with my supervisor's name. So whenever I get mail, dear professor Valeria, that was my supervisor, I immediately know that this really on to publish. Can I also add a little thing to that? Um, and some universities also allocate government funding um, based on your uh, articles and they will if you publish in a predatory journal uh, you will not get as much funding um, as you might have if you had published it in a, a low q um, journal uh, so it could also affect the kind of funding you get from the government allocations uh, if uh, your country has a lot of that as well so but I agree with you, Davor, you get a lot of funny emails from predatory journals uh, saying, dear Professor Rebecca, and I'm like, I haven't even gotten my PhD yet. <laughs> that, 
the best thing actually is that I got a few emails on, can you write a book on whatever topic you want to? We want to publish you and stuff like that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And then actually you go to the bottom of the page or I usually do clicks just to see what, what what's offering. And then you say, yeah, you have to actually um, buy 10 of your books as a publication fee. <laughs> That is very strange, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this was really great session. I would like to thank you one more time uh, for those great lectures. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation, uh, introducing us to the world of science and helping us in answering some of our questions. It was really my pleasure to be here and listen to you really thank you and you have virtual applause right now <laughs>